hello, welcome back. Today we're gonna to be doing a small art business Q&A and we're also gonna be chatting a bit about my journey to becoming a self-employed artist. I got a lot of different questions on Instagram about a bunch of different topics, so thank you to everybody who submitted a question to me. There are some personal questions, like how I became a small business owner, how long it took, my timeline. Also got some more technical questions, like how I outsource things, how I find manufacturers, how much stock to keep, as well as some social media related questions too, like how to grow an audience and so on. There will also be all the timestamps in the description, so you can just literally click to where you want to be, so you don't have to watch through like the whole video. I've also made a very similar video to this before, but at that time, I wasn't really making enough to call myself, you know, a self-employed artist, and a good amount has changed, so I thought it'd be nice to just film a sequel to it. That video I still like a lot, I think still has a good amount of information, so if you're curious, I'm gonna put the link up there so you can watch like a past version of this video. Also, I'm looking at my notes on my computer, so if I'm looking down a lot, that's why. So now that all of that's out of the way, we're gonna move to the first section of the video, which is gonna be like an introduction. So hello, my name is Megan. I am a full-time freelance artist, which feels really cool to like say out loud. I run this YouTube channel, obviously. <laughs> uh, I have an online shop where I sell prints and stickers. I sell things like tote bags and t-shirts now, and washi tapes, so kind of stationary and apparel. But in the past, I would sell things Things like clay jewelry and clay sculptures and stuff but now um, in the future in the coming months I hope to be selling actual ceramic wear. I also have a patreon account which is pretty essential to me just being self-employed and I'll talk a lot more about that later but shout out to my patrons I love you guys very very much and also recently I started twitch streaming which has been really really fun and like a new project for me so yeah there's a bunch of things I do on the internet as an artist now, I got a lot of questions about timelines so we're gonna talk about that first I started selling clay pins in around May of 2020. This is when the pandemic first started. I just graduated from college. I like lost this job that I had kind of, you know, signed a contract for. I was ready to employed in the workforce and they sort of said, see ya. So I just had a lot of this like nervous energy and a lot of free time. And I also just started playing a lot of Animal Crossing. I was watching a lot of TikTok and I decided, you know what, let me just make like a little Animal Crossing clay pin and put it on TikTok. And a couple of them went like semi-viral. People started asking, I wanna buy this. And I think that's also when like small business content started to gain more popularity as well. I just opened my Etsy shop. I started selling a bunch of Animal Crossing clay pins and that was really the birth of this whole thing. <laughs> From there, I started making different kinds of clay pins. I started getting into custom pet pins, which was really fun because I didn't feel like I was just copying an Animal Crossing character. I was sort of stylizing and being more creative. Um, I also did some fan art. I did like some avatar clay pins, some adventure time clay pins. Yeah, and then from there, I started really experimenting more with my illustration work and then moving a lot of my focus and energy from TikTok towards Instagram. So I think TikTok was really great for me because it helped me, you know, make a lot of sales in a short period of time with like zero audience. But I found that because I wanted to do more than just Animal Crossing, like I wanted to sell my own original artwork, I didn't really have an audience for that because my TikTok audience was very conditioned towards like Animal Crossing related stuff. So I kind of felt like when I moved from TikTok to Instagram, I kind of had to start from scratch. So I started, you know, experimenting a lot with my illustration. I'll put some things here, of some of my early work. Um, I had been drawing and making art all before that, like for a long period of my life. But this is a point where I started being like, oh my gosh, I want to illustrate more. I got so inspired by creators like Tiffany, Vicky, Jisoo, Lee, Cheyenne, just like a bunch of people that I was seeing and I was just like, this is so cool. Um, so I kind of tried to tap into that as well. So when December 2020 rolls around, I start thinking about, you know, who I want to be as an illustrator I, I start experimenting a lot and I made my first comic um, I love reading comics and I just kind of wanted to tell a story and I've made them before just like for personal things but never like out there into the world and people really resonated with it it got like a lot of likes and a lot of shares and it was very exciting and because I think comics are quite shareable forms of art my audience really started to grow at this point and I think like the relatability factor of comics was really important and just helping it get seen by a lot of people so at this time like my, my Instagram audience started to creep up in the numbers you know I was at like 100 200 now I was at like 500 800 ish and around January, I started making earrings. This was totally out of the blue too. I think I just decided, you know what? Let me just start 
try to sell some earrings because I was kind of feeling a little bit bored of clay pins and I wanted to start making more real wearables and they've actually sold very well to my surprise and from there I think because of my clay earrings my shop started growing too alongside my Instagram audience so I went from making like a hundred dollars a month from my shop to like a thousand dollars a month from my shop so February March and April rolled around and I kept on making earrings I started making some clay sculptures I kept on illustrating I kept on making comics and I also started selling my prints as well I think from these months were really critical where like my numbers went a lot higher and I think because of the work I was producing a lot of the consistency and also luck uh, my audience really started to grow but around this time like the April June time I started feeling super burned out just because like I had to pay these bills and I felt a lot of pressure and I felt a lot of financial pressure to have a shop update every month so you know the bills got paid and I started getting really tired of just like constantly pumping out products and not really taking time to rest um, and focus on other things. So around June I decided I wanted to start a Patreon account just because I thought if I can have a little bit of extra income from my Patreon I can take more time between my shop updates and really like give it my all every update instead of feeling super rushed to just develop products and then pack it them and then do it again and again and again and the patreon account was so helpful i didn't end up with like the amount of patrons i do now my patreon account really grew over time but if you're looking for patreon advice i highly recommend these two videos they both helped me a lot i look up to fran and lee so much and i think these two videos will give you like all the information you could want and yeah i hope that's like kind of a rough idea of like my timeline up to this point now i make money from my shop my patreon and youtube my youtube channel also grew a lot over the, these past few months and they're all fairly reliable sources of income now for me and i guess in general it might, might have taken me like a year and a half a bit more to get where i am now it wasn't all easy breezy times though there were so many moments where i felt like giving up where i just was like i should quit this i should focus on like finding a real job because there were a lot a lot of months where i wasn't making enough to even be you know genuinely self-employed so I, I don't mean to say this to discourage anybody or just be like you should stop it was super hard i just mean to say that to just acknowledge that it was extremely difficult i recognize that i got lucky from the algorithm a lot it wasn't just because i worked hard and i just want to acknowledge it was quite a bumpy and difficult road to get to this point okay so now we're going to move on to the next portion of the video which is products inventory and manufacturing i got a lot of different questions about this one of the most popular questions in this category was how I prepare stock, do I use any machines, um, what kind of equipment to invest in, what kind of equipment do I want to get in the future. So first off I have to say I do not use any fancy color printing or a Cricut or a silhouette to make my prints and stickers. In the beginning I just didn't find it was worth it to invest like 300 plus dollars in these machines especially because I just like wasn't entirely sure what I wanted my shop to be. I was making clay stuff at the time and I was just like Ooh, should I invest like hundreds of dollars in a sticker cutter? I also don't like operating machinery. I struggle with tech sometimes. I can get really frustrated. So I was just like, I would rather just spend $30 and buy a little bit of stickers than invest like hundreds of dollars to produce them myself. You also have to buy ink, you have to get sticker paper. I've heard sometimes it can be a pain to calibrate and maintain the machines. So personally, I just decided, you know, the amount of money that I'm spending extra to get these stickers made for me is worth it because that outweighs like the time and labor I potentially could spend operating these machines. But it was also like a pretty big investment, so I just didn't find it worth it in the very early stages to make such a large investment. But personally, like if you want to operate machines, you have the funds to do so, by all means do it. There are perks to owning your own machinery. Like you don't have to wait to produce the inventory. Like you can just make it same day, ship it out same day. You don't have to wait one to two weeks like I do to get the stuff in your hands. Sometimes manufacturing goes wrong and you're like oh I don't like how these colors came out when you do it yourself you have control over that personally just not for me I still don't use them I don't plan on buying a Cricut or like a fancy color printer anytime soon just because like I would rather just have it all produced have it all cut for me it saves me a lot of time I can spend other time like working on my YouTube videos making comics packing the orders designing new things in terms of other machines though I have a roller printer and I love it so much it saved so much time for me I actually made this investment recently recently, I was just like, 
should I do this? And it took me several months, like over a year to make the purchase. I was originally just using a regular printer, cutting every label out one by one and printing and taping it onto the package. And I was just like, I don't need the Rolo. Uh, but now that I have it, it's made my life a lot easier. So if you have the funds, I would recommend getting a label printer. But you can also do what I do as well, you know, wait a bit, wait till your business starts, you know, turning a bit of a profit and then invest that back into getting machines and things that might make your life easier. I think I waited a bit too long just because I feel like I tend to operate my business um, and lifestyle more on the conservative side of things. Hello, I'm editing right now and I realized I didn't record anything about what kind of equipment I would like to get in the future. For my small business, I don't think I'd really like anything other than, you know, maybe another packing table, you know, some more space, another shelf just to store things. But in terms of like Twitch streaming and my YouTube channel, I have a lot of things I'd like to get. I feel like I'd like to upgrade my camera to maybe something a bit more professional. Uh, and I would also really like to get one of those Shure microphones that a lot of people have. And I've heard those mics are really nice. So um, those are the two things that, you know, maybe in the future I'll invest in. Next question is about where I get my products manufactured and how do I find manufacturers? So if it's not like a handmade item, like um, my earrings and stuff, but I outsource my prints and stickers and my tote bags and stuff. All my prints are made at Cat Print, who I like very much. Um, I find the quality really nice. In my very early days, I was using Vistaprint just because it was cheap, but I don't love the quality Vistaprint makes for like my art prints. Nowadays, like if I have to make like a huge quantity of something, like my thank you cards, I tend to use Vistaprint just because it's cheaper. Um, but for like my professional art prints, I use cat print and I like them a lot. I also have a discount code if you want to use it. No pressure. It gives me a little bit of a discount when I order from them, but obviously no pressure to use that code. For my stickers, I get everything made at Sticker App. There's also a bunch of other sticker companies you can go with. I've heard of people, I know my friend Radia uses Vinyl Disorder. Um, I've heard of people using Sticker Ninja. Um, there's just like a lot of ways to go. I only use sticker wrap, so like I'm oddly loyal to them just cause like I've only used them and like I haven't had too many issues with them. And all the risograph prints I make are done at Resolve Studio, who I really like. I would recommend them as well. If you're curious also about like my art materials, I have a really long list of all my resources that I use on my Patreon. Um, you can also find that information like throughout my videos. I tend to talk about, you know, where I get things a lot, but if you want a nice concise place, check out my Patreon. <laughs> In terms of sourcing manufacturers, I don't have a lot of advice because I've kind of found cat print and sticker app through friends. I found Resolve and my tote bag manufacturer just by typing out like printing press Google and then just kind of seeing what pops up. For my tote bags, I just typed in like local LA printing press tote bag and then I just kind of read reviews and found them like that. So sourcing things locally is like a great tip for you. I know a lot of artists tend to go on Alibaba to search for manufacturers. Um, if you want to go that route, I don't have any advice for you because I haven't. So yeah, sorry. <laughs> so another question I got was how much stock should I order in relation to how many followers I have? Uh, I don't have a direct like number recommendation. Like I can't say, you know, if you have 2000 followers, get 30 prints. <laughs> but I would say like if you're just starting out, you kind of have a smaller audience, just go for lower quantities in the beginning. This is what I did because Again, I tend to operate things on a bit of a less risky side. So I would only order like 50 or 30 prints. Now I tend to order about 100 of each print, but I can, you know, honestly say I don't sell out of things very often. Like nothing I've made, maybe except the Rezo print, like sells out in one drop. So with one shop update, I tend to not sell out of anything. And you know, that's okay. I think I get sometimes a little insecure because I see, you know, other artists sell out of like thousands of products in one go and I'm like oh my god am I doing something wrong but like what works for me is what works for me and I tend to just order about a hundred and you know if a product does pretty well like I had a good soup print that ended up selling out after two shop updates I'm just gonna reorder more it's also kind of smart to do it this way if you don't have a good intuition of what products are gonna sell so sometimes if I'm testing out this new sticker and I'm just like oh, I don't know if people are gonna like this I'll order a smaller quantity and then I can test like, okay, people tend to like this a lot. Like I have this yellow um, serious artist sticker. So now when I do restocks of this, I'll get like, like 150 or 200 just cause like I kind of know that it's gonna sell well. I would recommend, if you're just starting out, I would recommend go for some lower quantities and then scale up in the future when you kind of know, hmm, people, people like this one, you know? All right, now we're gonna move on to finances, pricing, and money. I got a question about how much I should spend on expenses and how much should I invest in packaging fees. Um, it's hard to answer this because again, like what I've been talking about, a lot of this is your own prerogative. You know, it's like 
what is your preference? Um, and that's kind of the beauty of being a small business owner and doing this for yourself. Like you have total control. Like you're not working under someone. You know, exercise that. Like do make decisions that you feel most comfortable with. How much money are you willing to put down? How important is packaging to you? Personally, like I see artists with like insane packaging and beautiful custom tissue paper, beautiful custom tape and like confetti. And in the beginning though, this wasn't as important to me. I also, again, operated on a bit of the safer side. So I didn't um, buy, you know, fancy custom tissue paper and like nice packaging supplies like that. I actually used a lot of reusable supplies. I would take like craft paper I got in the mail and I would wrap that up and like write a nice little note. I would take yarn that I already had and like put a little bow on it. So it was very like DIY rustic looking packaging in the beginning. I spent like $20 getting some like pretty standard mailers. Now I operate things a bit differently. I source all my mailers from Eco Enclose. But yeah, I think like having nice packaging is cool though because you know, it makes your customers feel good. It kind of boosts the image of your product and like it kind of boosts the experience of opening your product but again it's like all personal preference like how important that is that to you if you like that you know go for it invest the money maybe don't get custom packaging in the beginning maybe you can get just like some standard pink or blue like depending like if you want to brand yourself maybe get um, some tissue paper that's like in your brand's colors. Like you don't necessarily have to make custom stuff either. And also remember these things can change. So in the beginning, you know, like I said, it was very rustic, it was very DIY. Um, but now I use little glassine white bags to pack all my orders. I don't have any custom stickers that I use. Recently I started making some custom labels with my roller printer. In terms of how much money I should spend on expenses, again, like I said before, I tended to be a bit more conservative. So I spent about $20 getting some mailers, $30 buying like my first little sticker, maybe $50 on like clay and acrylic wash paint. So that's like a few, I can't do math, but how much is that? Um, so like about $100 in the beginning. I will be making a how I pack orders video in the future. But in the meantime, I would highly recommend this video by my good friend, Radia. Um, she's amazing. You guys probably know who she is already, but this video has taught me a lot. Like I will reference this video when I'm just like, how should I pack this? Um, Cause Radia is so smart and has a lot of good tips in this video. Highly recommend. Another big question is how do I price my work? For stickers, I just priced by sort of looking at what my peers were selling. I saw most people sell stickers for like $3, $3 50. That's kind of just what I did. And then for prints, you know, around the same thing, I kind of just like looked at what other people were doing and kind of priced it accordingly. For Reason Prints, I landed around $18. I thought this would be like affordable, but also a good profit margin for me. It's hard to think about this too, because you're just like, how do I gauge this piece of art? But remember to factor in the time you spend designing it, the price of actually purchasing each unit. Remember to think of, think of your time. For handmade items, it can get a bit trickier. Again, personal preference. What I used to do is I would give myself like an hourly rate above minimum wage, so maybe about like $25. And then I would multiply that by how long it took me to make each piece and then add on the cost of materials. So I'd end up around like 35, 40 for each pair of earrings. But again, I've been saying this like a broken record. It's your personal prerogative. Like you put in the time to make this piece. If people kind of want to haggle you down, just remember to respect your time and respect yourself and know like i i work hard and like my labor has value i got a lot of tax related questions um should i do like my tax forms and stuff before i even begin i don't like making recommendations for this because i'm terrified of taxes i still am um, I'm terrified of taxes. I don't know a lot about them. So I would recommend looking at your particular state and county because every place in the US, if you live in the US, if you live outside, I have even less recommendations for you. But every state and county has different rules on how small businesses should operate. I know in California, like you have to get a permit and like you have to do a bunch of stuff. In New York, it's kind of different. So, you know, maybe just give a call to your local government office and just be like, what do I have to do? Um, but sometimes on their websites, they have information too. I would be very careful about sales tax as well. On every sale you make, there are sometimes moments where you need to be collecting sales tax and then pay it back to the government later. So if you're using a website like Squarespace that doesn't collect sales tax, maybe possibly in the future, you might need to pay that money back. So I would just keep that in mind. And I would recommend looking into it before you begin because I, I would rather like know, okay, I should have had a permit before like selling for three months and like not having it, you know? It can get extremely complicated though. Like there, I stress myself out so much thinking about like economic nexus and all that jazz. So that's why I started on Etsy in the beginning because Etsy will collect and remit 
permit sales tax for you. So I didn't even have to think about it. But that being said, I know people who like use platforms like Squarespace is totally fine. They just get accountants to help them. Another question I got that's related to this was like how I budget for my shop, how I budget for taxes and like my life. It's not a foolproof system, but what I do now is I have, I have a business debit card. So every expense I make for my business, I would use that card. Recently, I got a credit card instead because I was realizing, oh, there's such a thing called cash back. I didn't know about cash back. <laughs> I've been making much juicier purchases lately. Like I got um, some things for my streaming setup, like, you know, $100. So if I can get some like 5% back on that purchase is pretty cool. So I have a business credit card and a business card and that all goes back to my business debit account. And this is extremely helpful because it splits my business and my personal expenses. In the beginning, I didn't have that distinction and it got kind of confusing. I also have a spreadsheet where every month I will log what purchases I made. This is extremely helpful for when tax season rolls around and you need to know what your business expenses are. So on one side of the spreadsheet, it's all the expenses. On the other side, it's all the money I made. And it's good to just like look at it month by month and just know what, what the cash flow and business stuff is looking like. Now we're gonna talk about e-commerce stuff. We're talking about selling the stuff and like how you should sell it, what websites to use and whatnot. One person asked, how do you decide what kinds of products to make? One way is listening to what people like. If you posted like a piece of art on Instagram and people tended to really like it, you got a lot more likes than usual. You're like, hmm, people like this. Maybe consider making that illustration or whatever you made into a sticker, into a print. Or sometimes, if you're lucky enough, people will say, this would look cute as a print. I would love to have this at a sweatshirt. So you can just kind of listen to what um, your audience might be saying. But in the beginning, you know, no one was telling me this. No one was like, you should make this into a sweatshirt because like I didn't have any followers. So I kind of just used my own intuition about what people would like. For the Animal Crossing pins, I had people being like, can I buy this? Um, when I wanted to sell my own work, I didn't have these, you know, helpful nudges. So I started thinking about what would I want? Like as a, as a customer, <laughs> what would I want to purchase? And I thought clay earrings are super cute. I think they're quirky and they're kind of fun. I can put my own little spin on them. So that's what I made because I thought if I were to see that in someone's shop, maybe I would purchase it. Recently, I was thinking like, I really love washi tape. I love going on to my friend's art shops and buying myself a little roll. <laughs> So I was just like, maybe I should make washi tape. But again, you know, if you have no idea, maybe just try making a sticker, start small, um, maybe try doing something handmade so it's not like a huge investment for you. Another person asks, is it a good idea to start with fandom based work and then start moving to your own thing? Like by all means, people love fandoms. Like I started with Animal Crossing and Avatar and stuff, and now I'm doing my own illustration work. Um, but just be careful about copyright. I know people get a bit, you know, strict on etsy.com so just just be wary maybe instead of saying animal crossing nook uh, tom nook sticker just be like nook raccoon sticker i don't know <laughs> just be careful about copyright i've seen a couple art mutuals get their shops taken down or they get sent like warnings to stop so how did you decide where to host your shop so in the very beginning early days my first sale was on big cartel I actually watched this video by someone I also look up to very much. Her name's Claudia. She goes by The Forest Mori. She's actually a huge inspiration for me as well. I think that's one reason I started making clay pins too. And she recommended, you know, Big Cartel and Squarespace. I was scared of the taxes on Squarespace, so I went with Big Cartel. And then I started getting curious about Etsy and the whole marketplace, so I moved from Big Cartel to Etsy. So those are the two platforms I have the most experience with. There are perks to both platforms, right? So Big Cartel, it's your own storefront. You don't have to... I feel like the Etsy page, like it's not that cute. And like with Big Cartel, you can really customize it to look how you want. You know, it looks professional. It looks like your own website. They also collect sales tax for you, huge plus for me. But for Etsy, the thing is, is like you're on the marketplace. So I think I had, I got a couple sales from people looking for custom pet pins, but I find that Etsy fees are super high. Um, I'll put what it is right here compared to Big Cartel, but I, I feel like Etsy takes a lot of fees. So that's one reason why I tried to move off of Etsy. I still have my Etsy shop open for my UK and EU customers because Etsy handles VAT tax. And as of what I know now, Etsy is the only platform that is handling that. So I can still ship to the EU and the UK without any problems. Pros and cons. I'll put a little chart here. 
on Etsy. They're, they handle the tax for you. They handle VAT tax for you. You know, you might make a sale or two from the marketplace, which is kind of cool. Kind of like how Etsy's sales thing is laid out. You can see all the numbers and the quantities for every product and the addresses right on one page. And that's quite convenient when packing. Cons, they take a lot in fees. I, I have issues with Etsy too. I feel like I have beef with Etsy. I've talked about it before. They have this star seller program that I think is kind of bogus. Uh, I've never said bogus before. Why did I say bogus? I just think the star seller thing is kind of stupid. They love plugging free shipping at you. Like they're like, are you sure you want to make this $5? People might not buy it. But personally, I like being transparent about how much I'm charging for shipping because sometimes, well, I learned this from Radia by the way, companies will just, instead of saying, this product is $15, pay five in shipping, we'll just say $20, free shipping. It kind of makes you think like you're saving money, but you're not. So I just like to be transparent, that's my preference. But for Big Cartel, you have to pay like a monthly fee to use it, but I think for me at least, it evens out. I like having my own storefront, and I don't like feeling pressured about when to send orders out. Etsy really like hounds you. Squarebase and Shopify are also really valid e-commerce platforms you can check out. Um, they don't collect sales tax automatically, so that's why I don't use them as my main storefront, but I have a lot of friends who are very happy using Shopify um, and Squarespace too. I think in the future when I get like a fancy accountant to help me, I'll probably move to Shopify just because I think the interface is much more like professional and you can do a lot more than big cartel. Um, someone asked, sales administration as a small art shop. Um, I don't really know what you mean by sales administration. I don't mark down every sale. I try to keep track of my inventory. I can be a bit better about it. Like sometimes I wanna like give a friend a sticker and I don't like mark it down and I should. And I got a lot of questions about shipping, not packaging. That will be the separate video. But in terms of shipping, um, someone asked, do you handle your own shipping or do you buy Etsy labels? So I handle my own shipping. I used to use the platform GoShipo. I like it because unlike platforms like stamps.com, you don't have to pay like a monthly premium to use it. I link it with my Etsy account. So every Etsy order would show up on the GoShipo page and I can just ship and print labels from there. And I found it very convenient. But now I use Pirate Ship as well because that big cartel doesn't connect with Shippo for some reason. But I would recommend both of these. There's other ones too. I think of people, I've heard people use like ShipStation as well. Um, I don't love the Etsy label purchasing interface, so I just don't use it. Um, but I think I know people that use it as well. I would recommend looking at these different platforms and seeing which one seems the most comfortable for you. Someone asked, how do I figure out postage, especially for like different states and different countries? I would recommend using these shipping platforms because these shipping platforms just figure it out all for you. Like, I do not know, you know, I have to end up paying this amount to ship something to like Iowa. They automate everything. So the order automatically comes in. How do you keep track of addresses and shipping labels? I do this again through my shipping platform. I don't need to know everyone's address. So when I pack an order, I just write down the person's name. And later on, when I print out all the labels, I just match them together. It's like a little matching game. I could do this in a more efficient way. Sometimes I'm like, I think this is taking a bit too long, but this is just how I'm, I'm currently doing it. I just like pack in order of the orders that come in and print them like that too. So it tends to not be too difficult. The next topic we're gonna hit is social media. I think a really popular question I got is how do you promote your shop or your artwork when you have a small audience? Um, I talked about this a lot in my last video because that was when I kind of had smaller numbers. My biggest advice in that video was just try to market yourself to the audience you already have and then build up from there. Maybe you might not want to do this, but you could reach out to family, friends, people you know in real life, maybe post it on your personal Instagram too, just to get like your stuff out there and maybe gain some more traction. In the beginning, a couple of classmates were really kind and bought like my pins and they posted it on their own stories and I got some more sale just because people saw that and was like, oh cute, where'd you get that? And then you kind of get some more traction just by word of mouth. I also use TikTok, TikTok's algorithm. I, I have a suspicion that the algorithm isn't as good anymore for like organic reach. But in the in, when I first started a year ago, um, I found that the algorithm was great and like a bunch of people would see my stuff, even though I didn't have a lot of followers. You could try TikTok as well. But I must say it is very difficult in the beginning. Um, things can feel exceptionally slow. I felt like no one was looking at me. It was also very discouraging because you know, you're being really vulnerable saying like, here's something I made. Does anybody 
care. You know, try not to get too discouraged. Believe in yourself, your art is good, and just try to keep going, developing new things. Like you're not just only gonna make this one product, you're gonna keep on making new things and experimenting and trying out new stuff. It's gonna, you're gonna keep on growing. <laughs> Another question is, is it best to have a following before you start your shop? Not necessarily, like I said before, you can just try showing your stuff to people you already know. It obviously helps when you have a lot of people looking at your art to sell things. <sighs> and this is another tough question. How do you grow the art account? How do you grow an Instagram following? How do you grow a YouTube following? I think for Instagram and YouTube, it is a bit different. The idea is the same. I personally think it's a mix of consistency and luck. <laughs> and this is hard because I don't want to be like, if you have a lot of followers, you didn't earn it. You just got lucky. Cause that's not true. And even for myself, I recognize like I busted my ass to get here. Um, and I worked really hard and there were a lot of moments where I wanted to give up, but I just kept on making art. I kept on trying to share. And eventually, slowly, I got to this point. If you're trying really hard, you've been posting for a while and you're not really gaining the audience that you want, I, I wanna say like, it's not about you. It's just how these apps and algorithms work. It's not your fault it doesn't mean your art is bad by any means like I'm sure you're an amazing artist it's just how these apps work and sometimes people get pretty lucky and like I admit like it's not just because I worked hard that I have a following it's also because I got lucky but that being said another thing that I think helped me tremendously was the content I was making was very shareable. Like the comics I made, people resonated with a lot and that helped my audience grow. Not to say like, oh, make a comic, it'll work for you. I'm just saying this worked for me. Another thing that really helped for me, which I think was like, might even be the most important or the biggest factor was I made a lot of art friends and these art friends were tended to have a big following so I remember like I sent Tiffany something because I was an apple cheek stan I still am ride or die for you Tiffany <laughs> but like I sent Tiffany a little package just because like I really loved her work and, and she was really nice and shared it on her story and that overnight I got like a hundred followers which was a lot for me at the time um so I'm very grateful for Tiffany like I feel like that was like a, a really big boost that helped me a lot. Um, when I made a certain comic, I had Radia and like Lee share it, and that was also super helpful. So I got Paloma shared some of my stuff as well, um, and they have, you know, pretty juicy following, so that, that helped a lot. And that kind of leads me to my next question is how do you find niche communities of people who like your stuff? I think for me, I just, I think the, the algorithm sort of recommended me some accounts and I like followed them. And from there, I tended to interact not just with people who had like very large followings, but people who had, you know, numbers that were kind of similar to my own. And I would just like comment and be like, I really like this. And you know, I still talk to some of those people making friends and networking, not in the kind of slimy, I want something from this person kind of way, but just in a genuinely like comment on people's art, like give them feedback. Be like, I love what you did with the color here. And maybe they'll comment on yours. And it's like, it, it's like a, an interaction and relationship. It's like kind of about building relationships rather than like expecting something in return. You share their work, they share your work and you can help like boost each other up. So yeah, I would try making making some art pals. This can get a little tricky too, because I said, I think sometimes I also was just like, where are my besties when I first download the app? But like relationships take time, just like in real life with friendships, you know, you're not going to become someone's bestie overnight. It, it takes time to build those relationships. So be patient. <laughs> someone asked, how do you market yourself? Do you post ads or just social media? I do not buy those Instagram ads. Um, I kind of think they're a scam, but I mean, I have no confirmation on that. It's just my suspicion. Um, I just use social media and I really rely on like people sharing my work. Okay, we're nearing the end of the video. Uh, the next section we're gonna talk about is time management. One person asked, when should I open the shop? <laughs> Again, I feel like I'm a broken record. Whenever you feel like it. You know, you don't need to have like, 10,000 followers to open a shop. I opened my shop when I had like basically zero followers on Instagram and I grew from there. It might take a while before you get your first sale, but you don't really need to have certain followers to make a sale. You know, sometimes friends and family can support you too and you you learn and grow. I got a lot of questions about how I go from a part-time artist to a full-time artist. This is hard because I have never run my shop part-time. My job offer was rescinded after I graduated. So I never had the experience of being a student and doing this at the, full, at the same time or I never had the experience of working a full-time job and also doing this so like I can't give you the best advice because I've never gone through that I guess like if I were to say something I would just say you know be very careful 
about burning out. I know the shop can feel like so much fun and exciting, but I just don't want people to feel like they have to put in like all of their free time working on the shop and their art and also working a full-time job. It's really important to keep time for yourself and resting is super important. Um, so yeah, I think I would just be very careful about how you are operating and about how much time you're giving for yourself to rest. Someone asked, what does your schedule look like hour by hour? Also kind of tricky. Um, my, it depends on the day because I, I really like what I do and that I can just spend time doing different things every day. So one week I might be really focusing on getting a lot of Patreon work done. So in the morning I'll like answer some emails, I'll pack some mail, I'll take a good lunch. And then when I come back, I might like stream for two hours or I might like edit my entire YouTube video. So it really depends on the day, but I feel like that's kind of what makes this job really fun for me. Another question I got is like, how do you maintain work-life balance? This, it was a long journey getting here. In the beginning when I first started, I did not have any work-life balance. I was doing this all the time. I was barely resting. I was working weekends. And although I was super motivated cause I was just like, I want to be self-employed so bad. I need to work hard. I was kind of miserable. <laughs> I was happy doing the work, but like I was really tired and it got to me after a while and eventually I realized I cannot keep existing like this and I started taking weekends off. I started taking more lunch breaks. I started going on more walks. Nowadays, I'm pretty comfortable with my work-life balance. I am recording this on a Saturday, which I shouldn't be doing, um, but for the most part, I try not to do anything on the weekends. Weekends are just for fun, meeting friends, going places, relaxing. And during the day, I try to take two walks a day and I take an hour for lunch. And I feel like that really helps because these little breaks throughout the day are really nice in helping me not get too fixated on my work. Cause I tend to get really absorbed and I'm like, I need to finish this. So I'm glad that like, I kind of forced myself to be like, okay, it's break time. And that helps me like not get submerged in the work. Someone asked if you do this as a side job with a full time going on. Like I said before, you can do it. I know people that do that, but be very careful about burnout and work boundaries. I know people who do this, but I feel like I see them working all the time. And I just want to caution people, um, you know, make it your hobby, but also just please try to cut out time for yourself to rest your hands and your eyes, to decompress, do things that aren't business related. This can be a hobby, but it's also a lot of work too. Um, so just please be careful about taking care of yourself. Someone asks, how do I schedule shop updates and when do I pack orders? Again, totally depends on you and what you want. <laughs> I really feel like that's the theme of this video. You know, it's up to you. I used to have them monthly, but again, I was really burning out. I was so tired having them back to back. So with my Patreon, I started having them a bit less frequently. Um, and this way I have, now I have them, you know, once every two months. And then I tend to pack my orders like right after the shop update, just cause I, I want people to have their stuff. The last topic we're gonna cover is just personal reflections. These are kind of questions that I got that I didn't really know where to put in the rest of the video. It's less informational based and kind of just like my own personal thoughts and feelings. Was what something you wish you knew before you started? I think I'd have to say that growth can come in various waves. I think when I first started, I was posting a lot of comics. Sometimes I would gain like some more followers and I sort of somehow expected that upward growth trend to stay consistent, but there will be months and weeks where like I don't gain many at all and that's okay. Um, I think the growth can go up and down. Another thing is do things on your own terms. Don't feel like you need to do what other people are doing that you see online. Someone's has like a million different products in their shop. It doesn't mean that you have to do that. You can only sell two things and do that. Or if someone does this with their packaging, like yes, get inspired by them, but also don't feel pressure to operate your business the way someone else does. What were your top two biggest challenges? I think consistency and motivation were two big hurdles, especially in the beginning, even with YouTube, um, it was very demoralizing, just like, making a bunch of videos, spending hours and hours editing them and feeling like nobody was watching. Um, so keeping that my YouTube 
uploads consistent was pretty difficult. I was kind of unmotivated because I wasn't really getting a lot of views and I was putting a lot of work in. That was a really big challenge. Also just trial and error. Like I made a lot of mistakes. I still do. Well, every time I have a shop update, I'm like, oh, could have done that better. Um, but I think that's also the nature of trying something new, running your own business, you know, being your own boss. Like you're learning how to do stuff. Um, so mistakes are gonna happen and trial and error is gonna happen. And that's how we learn. Anything initially daunting, but got rewarding and easier later once you got used to it. Oh, that's a fun question. Um, shipping. I think shipping got a lot easier. I was so scared of shipping for some reason when I like made my first sale. I don't know why. I was just like, it was just very scary. I was worried something would happen. I just like didn't know how to do it. But once I went on Shippo and these platforms, it, it got a lot easier. And now I feel like I'm very confident with my packages. Is it overwhelming? <laughs> Yeah, uh, sometimes it is quite overwhelming. I think because now that I have a rhythm, it's not as overwhelming. I have this routine. I know how to manage my Patreon and my shop at the same time. You know, I know how to maintain my YouTube schedule while doing the shop stuff too. So I think I figured out a rhythm and routine that it works for me and is sustainable with like a work-life balance, but it does get overwhelming. It's hard to manage a lot of stuff at once. Um, sometimes I'll feel like I have to do a little bit extra work. Sometimes like I'll get a message um, on the weekend and I'll be like, I don't want to deal with this because I'm resting, but I'll naturally feel like, oh, but I want to get this done because I don't want to have too much to do on the week. I'm also constantly working during my work hours. I know sometimes, you know, when you have a full-time job, you can now slack off a little bit. Um, but for me, I don't find that. I feel like I'm, when it's nine to five, other, other than my breaks, like I'm working and it can get overwhelming. Also because like, People spend money on my Patreon and people spend money um, like buying my products and I wanna make sure that everything ships out correctly and safely. So it does get kind of stressful, just like wearing all these hats and like managing finances too on top of it. But I, I enjoy the work. <laughs> like I wouldn't do this and I wouldn't work so hard and be here now if I didn't like enjoy the work that I'm doing. Which task do you enjoy the most? Oh, I don't know. I guess maybe just making the art itself. I also really like making YouTube videos. I have a lot, I feel like my YouTube channel has done a lot for me as well. I don't think I would have the patrons I do or the shop sales I do without my YouTube channel because I feel like it's allowed people to kind of get to know me more on a personal level. So there's like a face behind my business instead of just buying this one thing from Target, like you know you're supporting me directly. So yeah, I, I quite like making YouTube videos. I like making new art and products. Um, I love making comics. Um, I also quite like packing. So I just named like four different things. <laughs> what keeps you motivated? Definitely my art friends. This is something I didn't expect starting out. I think I just like saw these videos of like Tiffany and Jisoo and Lee just like doing really cool things and running their shops and packing. And it looks so fun and exciting. But I didn't realize like by having my own shop and my, my Instagram that I would also make these kinds of connections too. So I'm just so, so grateful um, for all the friends that I've made. Um, they all, they're huge sources of inspiration for me. Like if like Paloma or Vicky or anybody, or Radia um, posts like a new video, I watch it. I just get like, wow, I just get so excited and I feel like invigorated. I'm like, I want to sell products again. Yeah, that's so dramatic, but I, they de genuinely really inspire me. And it, it just like makes this whole business and job um, seem a lot less lonely too, because I am doing everything everything by myself so it's nice to like follow what other people are doing as well see what products they're making what videos they're coming out with what kind of art they're making and support each other um, and it genuinely feels like a really warm supportive community and i'm just so grateful for everybody yeah what do i do about the anxiety of running a small shop um smart small like i previously said um, if you start, there's less of a risk if things tend to not work out. Um, not saying they will, but you know, like I think it helps take a bit of anxiety off my back when I realize like worst comes to worst, I don't sell this and that's okay. Baby steps are really important and I think that helps my anxiety too. It's like not as overwhelming when I break it up into just this small thing. Instead of like, I'm time to open a huge business by myself. Just think of like, I'm gonna make little stickers and I'm gonna try to put them on Etsy and see what happens. Um, so you just you know, frame it differently. How do you work on the courage to get started? Believe in yourself, <laughs> which is very hard. I wish I could give better advice on this. Yeah, I guess think of like, what's the biggest fear you have? Is it people might not like your product as much? Is it you might lose a little money and not sell anything? Think about that fear and sort of unpack it and like try to face like if, that, if that's the case, like I'm scared, no one's gonna like my work. If they don't, they don't. At least you made it, you put in the work, 
you should be proud of yourself for making that far and like try again. And I know that's hard. That's like, it's very easy to give this kind of advice, but yeah. So some parting words for you. I'm just very grateful for everybody and for believing in me and I could not be here without you. Like literally I wouldn't, I would be jobless. <laughs> Everyone has their own journey. Everyone does this differently. Don't feel like you need to follow the crowd. Do what feels right for you. You don't have to make the art a business at all. If it's just your hobby, don't feel like you need to make a shop to be like an artist online. Um, it's a lot of work and it, the, adding the business aspect to it does kind of tamper with the joys of making art and that's a balance I'm constantly trying to strive for. So don't feel pressured to make the art a business if you don't want to. And yeah, just take it easy. Remember numbers and followers and like sales you make is not a reflection of you as an artist. Like you are wonderful, I'm sure. Remember, you're very capable. I'm sure if you wanna go make this art a business, you're gonna do a great job. And um, feel free to leave any more questions or inquiries in the comments below. Um, if I can't answer them, I'm sure somebody else can. Community Vibes will help each other out and answer some questions if you still have any. And yeah, thank you so much. Please take care and I'll see you in